All right, y'all. Uh, so welcome back. Uh, 5.5. This is all about the green revolution. So uh, in the last video, we I kind of showed you some of the machinery from the green revolution. We we're comparing the second agricultural revolution to the green revolution. So uh, that's what the, the green revolution is what we're talking about now. And so in terms of time frame, you know, we're looking around in the 1950s ish. Uh, and so uh, 1950s to 1970s kind of thing. Uh, and remember, you know, things like revolutions often, there's no start date, especially for stuff like this. There's no, you know, hey, this is the year it happened and this is the year it stopped. Uh, it's all a very gradual thing, but, you know, taken in totality, the, these are kind of the, the times that it, that it happened. So, uh, so let's take a look at what we're going to look at with this unit. Uh, so we are going to look at uh, how the uh, Green Revolution characterized uh, in agricultural use of high yield seeds increased use of chemicals, and mechanized farming. All right, Green Revolution had positive and negative consequences. So this is going to be one of the keys, and uh, I'll, I'll get into that more in just a bit. So uh, here are just some of the, the new methods here. Uh, so the Green Revolution created higher yield plants using hybridization. We'll talk about that. Oops, there we are. Uh, and genetically modified organisms, GMOs, dangerous GMOs. Uh, and so, and we'll look at, at what GMOs are and, and what the controversy might be. Uh, looking at, again at pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers. Remember, pesticides, that kills pests, rodents. Herbicides kills weeds and things like that. Fungicides uh, kills the fun guys. <laughs> kills the fungus. Uh, and then, obviously, fertilizers to help things grow. So, uh, and again, these have positive and negative consequences. So we need to start off talking about this guy named Norman Borlaug. And so uh, you can see that here's this uh, movie about him down here, The Man Who Tried to Feed the World. Uh, this QR code is linked to that video. Uh, it's pretty neat, uh, actually. So he was an agronomist. Uh, and so he tried to develop, give this to you in a, in a short way, uh, his goal was to try to increase the production of wheat. Uh, and so he had some theories as to how, how to do that. And he first went down to Mexico and he was able to develop uh, a, a, a wheat variety that was super abundant, resistant to a lot of disease. And so it went from Mexico being in a deficit of, of, of wheat to being able to produce more than they could use. Okay. And so uh, it, it's a really big deal because he was able, you know, in different parts of the world, famine was a real concern, a, a real true concern. And so by doing what he did, he was able to increase food production for millions and millions of people. Uh, after he went to Mexico, then he went to India, and he kind of showed them the methods there and brought his seeds with him, uh, and India's wheat production skyrocketed, you know. And so uh, he, he was able to, through his work and the people with him, uh, he was able to help stop famines in large parts of the world. All right, he was awarded with the Nobel Peace Prize, Presidential Medal of Freedom, Congressional Gold Medal. You know, kind of a, a, a big deal. All right, so now there are critics of, of what he did because the methods that he came up with uh, required about something 10 times the water uh, usage of the regular wheat, uh, required a whole lot of fertilizer. And so those methods, you know, maybe not, may not be as sustainable in the long term, but uh, this is where we kind of get into this debate. And so I want to look at, if you've had econ, here's some, some econ terms and, and just, you know, how to think about this stuff because, you know, what's right, what we should do and what we shouldn't do, it's all, you know, you're going to hear, hear positions all over the place and, you know, the best you can do is what, what you think is right. And so I just kind of want to give you the, the sense of it. And I sh I'm putting this picture on here, not for effect, but uh, here's kind of the idea. So the Green Revolution came along and it did increase crop yields immensely. All right. And we're going to look at, at some of the, well, here's some yields here. Uh, and so you can see Mexico, India, and Pakistan. So 1950, they were all down here and you can see what happened in Mexico. Uh, and then you can see what happened in, in India and Pakistan. And that's a huge, huge, huge deal because this was the kind of famine that was happening in, in different parts of the world. India was really worried uh, because their population was expanding at an alarming rate and they were worried about food production. And so, you know, through these techniques, through this green revolution, they were able to provide for all these people. And so 
There are some costs though. And so when we think about this and try and say, was this good or not? You know, it's always remember the, the answer to most, is this good or is this right? It's always, it depends because if you were to say, look, we're going to reduce the water table and we're going to dump uh, fertilizer and create runoff uh, that's going to harm water downstream uh, and kill fish with algae blooms, things like that. Uh, is that worth creating more food to prevent this? I don't know. I think so. But, you know, that's just my own personal opinion. You know, you don't want to see people starve. But, you know, and so the, it, it's, it, and it really gets to does it need to be an either or? You know, do we have the technology to be able to do both of those things, uh, to be able to feed people and to create a sustainable environment? And that's the struggle, you know. Uh, and so that's, that's, you know, when we look at these costs and benefits, it's important to try to think that, you know, what is the real cost and what is the real benefit, okay? And, you know, then you go forward and you, you do the best that you can with it. So uh, if you, when you take econ, uh, go into a lot of that, but... Uh, that's kind of the real world application here. Were the costs of the green revolution worth the benefits? Or were the benefits worth the cost? Let me back, let me rephrase that. And so, you know, people debate this, uh, and it's, it's a healthy debate. But, you know, again, the idea is you want to be able to somehow have both have higher producing, uh, higher producing agriculture and not harming the environment at the same time. And that's, that's the goal. All right. So let's look at the, the Green Revolution politics. So the U.S. government did get into this uh, a fair amount because the idea was, and again, this is the 1940s and 50s, and so the Cold War was uh, ramping up in a big way. And so one of the big fears of the U.S. government was that hunger would be the breeding ground for communism. And so the U.S. government got wholeheartedly behind this idea of the Green Revolution uh, and trying to provide, help provide food to other countries. And so that was the idea. So there was a lot of government promotion of, of this stuff. Uh, India was facing hunger issues, and they sent Norman Borlaug over there uh, to help because they were fearful that if India faced a famine, then they would go uh, become a communist country, uh, and that would danger America, you know, create a, create a danger to America. And so uh, there's a lot of inner inner lacing parts here. All right, so let's look at uh, just some of the things. This will be on the AP test, that other stuff won't, but it's pretty interesting, I think. Uh, so one of the things that they did was uh, hybridization, so creating hybrid plants. Uh, so that would be when you kind of mesh two things together uh, and get a new type of plant. Uh, this is one that I just found uh, creates tomatoes and potatoes. So here's your French fries and ketchup. All right. Uh, and so, you know, but it's, and this is what uh, Norman Borlaug did with the wheat. He took different varieties and, and looked for positive things, you know, disease resistant or whatever kind of resistance that was beneficial and try to, you know, combine those two and create a new variety. Uh, and he did. He was wildly successful with it. Uh, so, oops, hang on just a sec. Uh, and so that, that's what we mean by hybridization, uh, resistant to various types of insects, short growing season, all that kind of stuff. Alrighty, let me pause this real quick. Uh, so that's what we mean by hybridization. Uh, then we get into this thing called genetically modified food. And so in the last 10 or 15 years, uh, this has become uh, a very controversial topic. Uh, and so uh, before we get, I got a video for this one because you know the, it, it's a scientific question and I am definitely not a scientist, but uh, so I've got a, a science video for you. Uh, but the idea is, to, uh, to take certain parts of one variety of something and introduce it into another plant, you know? Uh, and so I'm not, I won't talk to the science here, but uh, so when you look today, so here's, you know, uh, we obviously in the US are a believer in genetically modified crops in terms of what we grow. Uh, this is area planted with GM crops, percentage of total arable, arable land. Uh, you know, we're up here around 50%. Brazil is up there uh, very high. China's very low. And so there are some benefits definitely to genetically modified food. So uh, you can see most modern corn, uh, soybeans, cotton grown in the U.S. today are GMOs. So let's watch this video. It's about, I think, 10 minutes. Uh, and it gives you the science behind GMOs and why there might be some controversy. Uh, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. All righty. Oops, not hearing anything. 
go. So we made a video about this once before, but some of the studies we cited turned out to be bunk, and in general, I think we played our cards too close to our chest when it comes to how we really feel about genetic engineering here at SciShow. So, why are GMOs bad? They're not. They just aren't, not intrinsically, and certainly not for your health. We've been eating them for decades with no ill effects, which makes sense because a genetically modified organism is simply an organism like any other organism that produces tens of thousands of proteins, but one or two of them were proteins that were chosen specifically by us humans. Genetic engineering is necessary for the continued success of the human experiment here on planet Earth. Just like the advent of nitrogen fixing allowed for more fertile fields that saved millions from starvation, the fruits of genetic engineering, some sometimes literally, will help us face the significant challenges of a world with more and more people and a climate that is less and less stable. Of course, just like nitrogen fixing allowed Germany to build bigger bombs, genetic engineering is a tool that can be used for good or for evil. So yes, it must be studied and controlled and understood, but that understanding has to start with, like, us. Right now. If you live in the United States, you almost certainly eat genetically modified organisms, or GMOs. Thus far, it's just plants, though pretty much every kind of meat on the market was likely fed with GM corn at some point. And it won't be long before the animals themselves are genetically modified. In 2012, the FDA reviewed a new kind of Atlantic salmon engineered to have higher levels of growth hormone using the genes of Pacific salmon and an eel-like fish called the ocean pout. They concluded that the engineered fish was safe and opened up the discussion for public comment, but still haven't announced a final decision. GMOs are everywhere in the U.S. Pretty much literally. 95% of sugar beets, 88% of corn, 94% of soybeans grown in the U.S. contain traits like being insect resistant or herbicide resistant that were engineered into them. And some crops are genetically modified simply for human benefit. Around 500,000 children go blind every year because of a vitamin A deficiency. So a strain of rice has been developed that, unlike normal rice, contains enough vitamin A to keep children healthy. Or healthier, anyway. Now, the term genetically modified or organism is actually somewhat of a misnomer. I mean, people have been genetically modifying organisms since the invention of agriculture. Every plant and animal species has natural genetic variability, and for thousands of years we've harnessed this variability by practicing artificial selection. We cultivate and breed organisms to emphasize their most desirable traits. Cows that produce more milk and squash plants that survive drought. Brassica oleracea, also known as wild cabbage, has been bred so intensively that it is the wild ancestor of half a dozen different garden staples, including broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, brussels sprouts, kohlrabi, and kale. Corn originally looked like this. Over years of selective breeding, we have turned it into a massive, crazy, giant mutant version of itself that we happily throw on the grill without thinking of the centuries of breeding necessary to turn a grass seed into a sweet and starchy masterpiece. But when we talk about GMOs today, we're actually talking about genetically engineered organisms, or transgenic organisms. We're talking about genes from one species being extracted and then fused into the genome of a different species. This is called transgenesis, and though not all genes GMO food is created this way, transgenic crops are by far the most common kind of genetically engineered organisms you come across. But here's the thing, engineered organisms aren't new either. We've been tinkering with food in laboratories for nearly a hundred years. In the 1920s, scientists realized that they could cause mutations in plants, thereby creating more genetic diversity and possibly more desirable traits by exposing them to x-rays and gamma rays and various chemicals. Through the 1970s, these methods of mutation breeding were quite popular and completely unregulated and largely ignored by the public. Thousands of cultivars produced this way are currently on the market. It's a kind of brute force hack. Just mess the genes up, plant the seeds, and see what happens, and then breed the cool new traits back into various strains of crop. Then, in 1983, scientists pioneered a new tactic, where they successfully took a gene from an antibiotic-resistant bacterium and spliced it into the DNA of a tobacco plant. Now, of course, antibiotic-resistant tobacco doesn't have any real purpose, but it did prove that single gene transfer was possible. The new practice of transgenics was born. Now, the GM industry wasn't really able to take hold until 1994 when the USDA approved something called the Flavor Saver Tomato, a fruit invented by a California biotech company that was altered so that it took longer to ripen, giving it a longer shelf life. It was the first genetically engineered crop sold to consumers. The Flavor Saver, though, didn't last very long, partly because people didn't like the taste, and partly because others, mainly in Europe, were suspicious of its genetic alterations. The Flavor Saver and its non-ideal flavor touched off a debate that continues to rage. Today, most GMOs aren't found in your produce section like the Flavor Saver. 
flavor was. Instead, more than 90% of commercially grown GM foods are commodity crops, staples like feed corn and soybeans, which have been modified to resist herbicides or insects. These crops are used to make the ingredients in lots of the processed foods we eat or are used as fodder for animals that we later enjoy consuming the flesh of. Probably the most well-known of these transgenic crops are the so-called Roundup Ready crops. Foods like soybeans, corn, sugar beets, cotton, alfalfa, and canola that are engineered to resist the active ingredient in the herbicide Roundup. These crops provide us with some, you might say, digestible examples of how transgenic foods are engineered, why they're made the way they are, what they do, as well as what they don't do. Let's start with why they were made in the first place. The active ingredient in the herbicide Roundup is glyphosate, a chemical that inhibits an enzyme plants use to synthesize amino acids. By blocking this enzyme, Roundup stops plants from making what they need to grow and metabolize food, thereby killing them. And it pretty much takes no prisoners. So much so that it can be hard to use around plants that you don't want to kill, like your crops. So in the early 1990s, the company that makes Roundup, Monsanto, decided to develop crops that were resistant to glyphosate, so farmers could spray the herbicide over their whole crop, but only kill the weeds. See, there are these microorganisms that produce an enzyme that is unaffected by glyphosate. All Monsanto had to do was transfer those bacteria genes to food plants, and farmers could use Roundup to protect their crops without killing them. So they extracted small pieces of bacterial DNA that were responsible for making the enzyme and set about introducing them into plants. But how do you get the genes of a bacterium into the nucleus of a plant cell? On the Tree of Life, plants and bacteria are not even on the same branch. Well, it turns out that there are a couple of pretty interesting ways. The first involves gene guns. Yeah, you heard me. Gene guns. Gene guns do pretty much what they sound like, literally and kind of haphazardly blasting DNA into plant cells. Most commonly used to engineer corn and rice species, they start with tiny particles of gold that are coated with hundreds of copies of a desired donor gene called a transgene. Cells from the plant that's going to receive the new genes are put into a vacuum chamber and then fire away. The gene-covered gold particles are shot at the cells using high-pressure gas. Once inside the nucleus of a plant cell, the gold dissolves and the scientists cross their fingers and hope that the DNA is taken up by the chromosomes in the nucleus, which it sometimes is. Once the transgenes have been incorporated into the plant's DNA, it can then be bred into offspring plants. It's not exactly elegant, but it's a heck of a lot more subtle than just bombarding the seed with radiation and hoping for the best. Another more recent and more effective way to create transgenic organisms involves using a soil-dwelling bacterium called agrobacterium. This is a plant parasite and a natural genetic engineer. It has an extra and quite special piece of DNA called a plasmid that can move outside the bacterium and implant itself into a plant cell. In nature, the agrobacterium uses this little trick to recode plant cells to grow food for it, but in the lab, engineers can use the plasmid as a kind of carrier for fancy transgenes, using it to infuse plant cells with new genetic material. So, whether you've used the agrobacterium or the gene guns, you now have a new engineered crop plant. But you can't just put that thing into the ground. You have to introduce this new genetic material into existing traditional strains of the crop. This last step, called back crossbreeding, involves repeatedly crossing the new transgenic plant with breeding stock over and over again until you wind up with a new transgenic crop. At the end of the process, Monsanto had a patented plant that could be sprayed with glyphosate and survive. Previously, plants would have to be seeded far enough apart that machines could till away competing weeds, increasing soil loss and costs to the farmer, not to mention fuel consumption. Plus, Monsanto gets a whole new massive customer base for glyphosate. It's a long process. The whole thing can take as long as 15 years, but that's how just about all genetic engineering is done to your food, whether scientists are putting a bacterium's antibiotic resistance into a tobacco plant or an eel's growth pattern into a salmon. Of course, then there's the process of getting the crop or animal approved for use, which can also take quite a number of years. At the moment, it's extremely expensive, though there are some technologies on the horizon that might make it cheaper. The fact that it's so expensive and yet still economically worth doing indicates how extremely useful GM crops can be. It also means that the companies that produce them closely guard and restrict the patents and sale and growth and even research done on the crops. One of the reasons engineered foods are attacked so viciously is not because of the scientific consequences of their existence, but the economic and cultural consequences of placing so much power over our food supply into the hands of very few, very large companies. The GMO debate has become something of a surrogate for a much larger debate about economics that frankly is out of our league. There are some scientific concerns about genetically modified food. How does inserting a single gene, for example, rather than swapping out huge chunks of genetic material affect the genome at large? We used to think not at all, but it turns out that the genome is more complicated than that. Additionally, many farmers save non-patented seed for next year's crop, something you can't do with patented GM crop seed. But if your public domain seed was unintentionally fertilized by a patented strain, you might find that suddenly the seed you saved from last year's harvest to plant next year has genes owned by someone else, someone who is, it turns out,
turns out suing you. And if your livelihood depends on selling certified organic crops or selling into markets where GMOs are prohibited, the consequences can be even more dire. And of course, the traits we're engineering into crops might have potential ecological effects. Like if we're engineering in insect resistance, we want to make sure that we're not harming the insects that we do like, like bees and butterflies. But after having been consumed in hundreds of millions of meals by me and probably by you and having been studied for decades, uh-oh. Sorry about that. Hello, I'm Hank Green, and this is Sci- no. Huge chunks of genetic material affect the genome at large. We used to think not at all, but it turns out that the genome is more complicated than that. Additionally, many farmers save non-patented seed for next year's crop, something you can't do with patented GM crop seed. But if your public domain seed was unintentionally fertilized by a patented strain, you might find that suddenly the seed you saved from last year's harvest to plant next year has genes owned by someone else, someone who is, it turns out, suing you. And if your livelihood depends on selling certified organic crops or selling into markets where GMOs are prohibited, the consequences can be even more dire. And of course, the traits we're engineering into crops might have potential ecological effects. Like if we're engineering in insect resistance, we want to make sure that we're not harming the insects that we do like, like bees and butterflies. But after having been consumed in hundreds of millions of meals by me and probably by you and having been studied for decades, there has been zero indication that genetically modified food poses a danger to human health. That has not stopped an extremely vocal opposition from funding poorly designed studies and publishing misleading papers. We here at SciShow even reported on a study indicating that GMO caused an increase in cancer in rats. This study, led by a guy who was not coincidentally publishing a book on the topic that same week, was published in a peer-reviewed journal and was initially taken at face value. But cherry-picked data, a lack of dose response, small sample groups, and a strain of rat that has an 80% chance of developing cancer in its lifespan eventually combined to completely discredit the study. Of course, as with any new technology, it can have unintended consequences, it can be controlled and monopolized and even weaponized, so there's plenty of reason to keep an eye on the companies making these advances. But when considering the number of hungry people on the planet, we have an obligation to explore every possible avenue to increase crop yields and decrease the amount of herbicide, pesticide, energy, and water needed to produce a crop. Traditional and advanced breeding methods need to be a part of that, and so does genetic engineering. Thanks for watching this episode of SciShow, and thank you to the people who pushed me to write up a more complete and accurate version of this episode. If you want to continue getting smarter with us, you can go to youtube.com slash SciShow and subscribe. Alrighty. So... Uh, that's just, that's the science of it, uh, you know, and there are, and I thought he did well uh, at the end talking about the debate of it uh, in terms of your health. Uh, if you eat one, uh, there doesn't seem to be any science to support that it would hurt your health. There are other issues though. And so, again, just like when the Green Revolution, like we were talking about, uh, when, when Norman Burlog came along, uh, you know, and, and created the need for more fertilizer, more water, all that kind of stuff. Uh, there was a cost there, but the benefit was to feed, you know, millions of people. And so this is the same kind of thing. Uh, there are always going to be, you know, good parts and bad parts. And it's just, you know, incumbent on us to try to look at it and become aware uh, and educated about what the situation is. All righty. Uh, so almost done. Uh, so the other thing uh, that, that was introduced in a big way during the Green Revolution were pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers. And again, these increase crop yields, uh, which is a very, very good thing. That's what you want. Uh, but then there are some downsides. All right. And so when we talk about herbicides, where's my marker? Uh, there we go. Uh, talk about herbicides, that's targeting weeds and other invasive plants. One of those GMOs that he was talking about is, uh, was with Roundup. Roundup is, uh, it kills a lot of weeds. Uh, and so they, the, the group that, that created Roundup, Monsanto, created uh, seeds that, that are resistant to its own uh, herbicide. And so you can spray everything, the entire field, and the only thing that survives are the seeds that Monsanto sold you. And so, you know, that's kind of the idea of, of you know, some genetic engineering. And so, anyway, I'll leave it at that. Uh, also, we see the introduction of chemical nitrogen and phosphate, uh, putting that into the ground to help uh, plants grow. And so, you know, uh, great the green revolution huge crop yields uh with some environmental consequences be a way to sum it up and by the way this uh qr code here is just a link for a video uh looking at the the risks of all of these pesticides and herbicides uh lastly we looked at uh new farming methods uh and so the uh machinery we did in the last video when i was showing you all the, the different advances and so you know this would be an example just that the technology is incredible uh, new irrigation methods changed, became more efficient and more sustainable uh, in some parts. And so you can see these would be some of the new irrigation methods. And also, 
uh, increases in transportation, advancements in transportation. And we can see, you know, container ship here, it's so much cheaper to ship stuff across the ocean today uh, than it used to be. And so obviously you're not shipping fresh strawberries like this, but you can ship dry goods uh, in a ship like that. And it was so much cheaper. And so, you know, the, the U.S. is a net exporter of agriculture. We are the world's biggest agricultural exporter. And so things like this have made that possible. Trade agreements uh, have helped. So the government's got a role here as well. Uh, but this makes the economics of it much, 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 much cheaper. All right. Uh, so remember this slide. This is, this is a big one. So uh, the positive and negative effects of the green revolution. So obviously higher yields and less starvation. I mean, that, that's, that, that's just, you can't not look at that one. Uh, lower death rates and growing populations in developing countries. I mean, that is, that's the big one. You know, that's, that's why they're trying to do a lot of this stuff. Uh, countries like Mexico and India became exporters of food instead of importers. And again, they had enough food for themselves uh, and then left over. Increased production brought lower prices. Remember, as supply goes up, prices come down. And so here's one of the problems. Uh, that can hurt, as we saw in uh, one of the videos we watched. If the prices are coming down, that can hurt the small farmers. And so you might be driving small farms out of business. And uh, one of our sections coming up is about agribusiness, so the growth of you know, factory farms, basically. Uh, and so we see a lot of uh, small farmers getting pushed out. But, you know, so that's bad for them, good for the consumer because the prices are low. You know, and again, is this stuff good? It depends. It's always your first response. Uh, money and profits increase for universities and agricultural companies. Uh, and then they can do the research, you know, uh, and that's, that's where we're at now. Now, the negative side here, capital intensive farming methods led to consolidation of factory farms, like we just talked about, and loss of family farms. And so people would have to move to the cities uh, looking for jobs if they were not able to maintain their farm, which is hard against a big company uh, because of that economies of scale. And uh, we'll talk more about that. More machinery meant that fewer women worked in agriculture. Uh, their role is marginalized more in agriculture. And so they left the farm uh, moving to a city. Uh, at a higher rate. Negative environmental effects, soil depletion. Uh, these would be good to jot down. Soil erosion, algae blooms, bee die-off, desertification. Uh, and so, again, we're trying to, was the Green Revolution good? Feed a lot more people, but there are some negative effects. All right. And then all, not all regions or countries were included. Africa still lags behind in agricultural production. And so, you know, yeah. So, Again, good things uh, combined with bad things, like everything in life. All righty. Uh, so I think that's it. Uh, you can pause this here, and uh, I think this is the last question on your terms thing. Uh, but you can read this, and you know you should have a decent understanding now of what we mean by the green revolution and what are those good and bad things about it. All right, uh, because we got a lot more people in the world and a lot less hungry people uh, than as a percentage. So anyway, uh, that's it for this one. Go ahead and pause this, and you can read it all. Uh, yeah, y'all take care.